Hey guys, so I've been getting a lot of questions through the blog and YouTube lately uh, regarding how you sort out your systems in your tiny house. So for example, like how do you lay out your plumbing? Um, should you use solar? Do you go off grid? Does my oven need to be 12 volts? Can I run my oven on solar? Is gas better? All these sort of things. So what we're going to do here is try to run through what we've done and some of the other alternatives and try to help you guys out. So this represents our tiny house. Uh, we have a bathroom here. And then I'll just, we've got a kitchen here, so we've got like an oven, um, and we've got a sink here. I won't draw everything in. Uh, then we've got like a shower head here. Sorry, that looks horrible, but you get the idea. There's some water coming down. Um, so for our water system, we have, uh, there's a cold water coming in here, and that's a tap, this may be a hose that connects to your water source. So we have, to heat our cold water, we have a gas hot water heater, or a Califont, and there's some gas bottles, that, that. Uh, supply fuel or energy for that. So we've got cold water that comes up into the Califont and we've also got cold water that goes to the shower then there's cold water that goes to there and there's a um, washing machine, uh, not a washing machine, uh, yeah and then there's also a washing machine and a basin too but I won't worry about those at the moment. So to get hot water the cold water gets converted to hot water in the Califont. That goes to the shower, so you can have nice warm showers. And it also goes to the kitchen. And, okay, so not we haven't got it in our system because we've got a pressurised pump away from the tiny house. Um, but you may have a pump so here, pumping the cold water through, if you haven't got pressure. Um, you may also have like a header tank up here that's using gravity to get your pressure. But, so this is the most, this is probably the most common way of doing it for a tiny house, using uh, the power of gas. So here you could, there's other ways of heating your water. So you could use a hot water cylinder, um, which are quite a, you know, an old, a lot of older school houses use. But you're going to have something like, probably like that, <laughs> taking up heaps of room. So that doesn't really lend itself so well. Uh, they can be a little bit uh, inefficient too because they're heating all the time and losing, losing a little bit of heat. But they have got a lot better. So they don't tend to work that well, and also the weight of holding all that water. Uh, you could use um, a little log fire, and then you have uh, like uh, basically a heat exchanger in here. So as the hot heat passes, say the cold water. Might even be a loop around like this. Uh, it's very simplistic, but as the hot hot water passes through, it heats the cold water, and you can use that, which is a very uh, it's an efficient way and a cheap way of doing it. But then in summer, you might not want to sort of run your fire and do that. Um, it does get more complicated and expensive as well. So again, like the Califont is. It's pretty hard to beat. Um, really the only reason I don't like it is you're burning gas, which isn't super environmentally friendly, and we're trying to be sort of environmentally friendly here. 
So the water side, and of course here too, you've got to have your waste. You've got to have your waste coming out here and here and da da da. But really, your your water is pretty straightforward, really. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, the electrical side of things. Um, I'll show you the setup that we've got at the moment, and I'll show you where we're going. So in your house, well in our house and in most houses, let's say, let's say we've got a, I'll go back to try to colour code. Let's say this is a fridge and so it's, there's a wall socket there and that plugs into there. Um, and then what else could we have? We could have a range hood say up here as well and there's a socket, socket there for that. And we'll say there's another one here, and that's a real high one for your um, for your phone to charge. Super practical. Okay, so we have currently a caravan plug. Uh, say over here, and that's plugged into uh, a house in our case. So that's 240 volts. So that's the voltage, mains voltage in New Zealand is approximately 240 volts. And then in our case, that goes to a distribution board. So we'll just call that uh, DV. And that goes into, so we've got a main switch. Label that S, and then it goes into after that uh, RCD, and then we have three circuit breakers CBs. So the switch that isolates power to the whole system. So you turn that off, no power at all. And right, let's make yeah, let's make these blue, and then that goes to the RCD, which is without getting into it, is basically a safety device, uh, which is mandatory in caravans or tiny houses, uh, permanent homes in New Zealand. And then we go into in our case we've got three circuit breakers, so we've got three separate circuits. And those circuit breakers are protecting the wiring of the circuit. Uh, so if the wiring, like for example, gets too hot under too much load, that'll trip and, and kill the current so it doesn't fry the wiring. So the reason we've got three, we've got, right, we've got one. There's a, we've got a lot more. We've probably got, say, 12 sockets around the whole house. And one, one side of the house has approximately six, and the other side has six. So we'll split that up. So we'll just say that this side here is powering these two sockets. And then uh, our other circuit breaker, we'll just say that one, in this case, is powering just the fridge. So you could, you pro could probably do them all on one circuit. Um, but we chose to split them into two, just so if you like lose one side, for whatever reason, you've still got the other side that you can plug into. Um, then the third one we've used, and you can, you don't have to do three, you can do one, you can do ten, it doesn't matter. So then the third one actually goes into what's called a power supply. Power supply or a LE or LED driver they can kind of be called the same thing if you search those and that's just a little box and what that does is steps uh, say 240 volts going into it and that steps it down to 24 in our case or it could be 12 could be 48 um, anything sort of 48, 50 volts and lower sort of classed as low voltage. 
where 240 volts is high voltage. So anything that's low voltage, you don't need to be registered or anything, you can, you can work on that yourselves. Anything that's high voltage needs to be done and checked and signed off by a registered electrician. Uh, so we've got, in our case, again I'm saying our case a lot, so we'll stop saying that. And we've got some, we've got LED lights. We've got a lot of uh, LED light stripper, uh, strips. And we'll just say we've got two, two lights here. And one goes, a bit of power goes into there and 24 volts goes into there and powers those. And we also need, we just need 24 volts for the ignition in our oven. Now we'll get on to the oven in a second. So you could negate this 24 volts all together and run your lighting and your sockets, um, your fridge, whatever, everything on 240 volts, that'd be the way to go. And the reason why we went to 24 volts is uh, lighting, low voltage lighting these days is really efficient. Like we've got about a 100 watt light bulb equivalent um, running in our tiny house and yeah, you wouldn't believe it. Or the other option is you could run everything on low voltage so everything would be maybe 24 volts or 12 volts so that means your fridge would be, we'll just say 24 volts in this case, would be 24 volts. Um, all your charges, your range hood, your fans, everything, which you can totally do. The reason we didn't do it, these things tend to be like marine appliances or there's a lot in the RV trucking world that you can buy. They tend to be a lot more expensive because there's way less of a demand for them. Um, we found too they tend to be, I think they're a little bit uglier because yeah they're not so much in that consumer consumer world so much so it's not so driven by beautiful design. Um, and yeah they're just harder to get hold of, there's less selection, uh, it's a bit of a pain when when your mate turns up with their charger with a three pin, you know, standard plug and they're like, um, oh sorry, you can't use that <laughs> in here. I know you can use USBs and stuff. But so that's the reason why we went to 24. It just keeps everything in a way a lot cheaper because you can go to Noel Leeming's, Harvey Norman, wherever, buy a fridge, chuck it in, done. If it blows up, you can go and buy another one. You know, it's not a big mission to order one from women overseas or something. So going back to the gas, we've got, uh, in our case, we've got uh, two LPG gas bottles. I think one's, one's a 14, yeah, we've got two LPG gas bottles. One's a 14 litre and one's a 9 litre. Those 9 litres are the standard sort of ones that you buy, those swapper bottles and whatnot, which two of those are probably pretty good. And then we've um, just got a changeover valve, so when one runs out, it flicks over to the other, uh, it indicates that, and you can, go and you can go and fill up, go to the fuel station, fill the bottle up and bring it back. Uh, we went for the 14, just because we've got a bit more capacity that way, and then you can... Um, use the nine as a, you know, a backup uh, for when that runs out for that short time that you need to go and replace it. So, gas, 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 gas. So there's obviously gas going to the Califont to power that. Uh, on another note too, that that Califont, if it's a domestic one, that needs uh, 240 volts as well. That's another reason. <laughs> why 240 volts is handy. Um, or if it's more of a marine type one, it might be batteries or it might be low voltage. So again, you can look at that. So gas, gassy gas, uh, I kind of another colored pen, but anyway, gas is red. So we've got gas going 
boom, to the oven as well. So we've got gas going to our oven, which does the hobs and the inside of the oven as well. So we've chosen to go for gas oven because we are going to go to solar. Um, probably at, it'll probably be the last thing we do on the project, but for the time being, we're running off the 240 volts. So if you do the calculations on running an oven over solar, um, I'll put a link, a link up on the video here. You can go to the spreadsheet that I created to work this out. If you run an oven on solar, you'll be pushing things big time because ovens draw a lot of current compared to anything else. And it's not impossible, but yeah, you might need a massive bank of solar panels up there. So, again, so gas lends itself again quite well to the tiny house um, portable situation. And that's why you see gas a lot on boats, caravans. So now we go on to solar. So we're going to run, I don't know, I think we're going to run four panels. Again, that's a whole topic in itself, how many panels you need. So basically what you've got with solar is these panels are all linked together. And these are like, we'll say 24 volts. They could be 12 volts, but we'll just say 24. Um, so basically with solar, say, we'll still keep our um, connection to the grid at 240 volts, but you could get rid of that. The power supply anymore, so that's from high voltage to low voltage. So basically you have a charge controller here, just call that a CC. So what that does, I've got birds coming into the shed, get out of here. So we've got uh, back, so a charge controller, what that does is because the sun shines down on these panels, and there's clouds, and it's high in the sky, it's low in the sky, there's heaps of variables going on. These panels are getting all sorts of different currents chucked at them and some might be higher than others and um, so what this is basically doing is controlling all of those variables um, and it's filling up the battery so you'll have some batteries here you might have this technology is changing quite rapidly um, so you might have had the old school sort of car style looking batteries that are all linked together and are linked to the charge controller and again they're at uh, 240 volts and you can do all sorts of things with series and parallel and I won't get into it at the moment. The charge controller is supplying current to these batteries and it's making sure it doesn't overcharge the batteries or undercharge them, it's keeping them equal and balance, it's basically balancing all that out. Um, and then from there, you, uh, let me go, uh, let me, colour coding's gone all out the window. So from there you have an uh, inverter, the invert. So that's going from 24 volts to 240 volts. So we're back at back at mains again. And so that there will now, so before you go into that, of course you'll get rid of that leg there. So anything on 240 volts, so your lights, maybe your fans, uh, whatever it is, some of your phone chargers might be on two, uh, 24 volts. Now it goes directly to there. So that's now a very efficient system because there's no stepping up or down of current. And your 240 volt. What colour have I done those in? Let's do it in blue. Uh, your 240 volt now goes into here. 
So that there, that's uh, that's actually kind of wrong because now, no, that is right. Here you'd actually have a fuse in there just to protect those wires, like a circuit breaker. That one there would disappear. All that power supply, as I said, that's all goes now. Uh, that's gone. So now, yep, you got 240 volts, back into distribution board, same again, RCD, circuit breakers, that's your normal sockets around your house, what everyone's used to looking at, and that powers those up. So as you can see, retrofitting a, sol a solar system after the fact, when you're running mains, is actually relatively easy. Um, you know, there's not too much you have to do, you just got to have a bit of room for like this stuff. But now this stuff is turning into things like, everyone probably heard about the Tesla power wall, which basically puts all of that into a sexy box that you can hang on the side of your house and talk to your mates and have a beer about it. And so you might be sitting there thinking, where is your guys heating at? Uh, we don't have any. <laughs> so yet to be proven, but I'm standing in here at the moment, it's actually quite cold outside and it's pretty warm in here, no one's been in here. Um, so we're going to try not to have any heating. Uh, with two of us in here, turn the oven on, I think it's going to be pretty warm. We might need something, but it'll probably just be a, quite a, you know, a little energy efficient uh, bar heater, those panel heaters that you can put on the wall, whatever something like that um, and the reason why we're quite efficient is we've got 100 mils of polyurethane again you can check out our other blog posts for that so we've gone down the methodology of keeping the house really airtight really thermally efficient um, and save on your heating costs I know your heating costs for a tiny house aren't going to be much um, you could put a heat pump in really efficient we just found making the house really airtight and efficient that a, even a small heat pump's just gonna, you know, it's gonna heat this place up in minutes and then, you know, just cruise. So, yeah, we'll let you know, we'll let you know how the heating thing goes, but uh, I think we'll be right. But it's something that you guys might need to con want to consider. Also, a small little log burner, they seem quite popular. But again, I've heard a lot of people, tiny little log burner in a small space, within an hour it's piping hot and you've got all the windows open. So, I don't know, it's horses for courses. Check, have a think about it, have a look at the options, see where you want to go. Um, I think that's about it. I hope that made some sort of sense. Um, it's, yeah, there's a little bit going on and I know it's quite daunting at the start of the process, you're like, oh, heck, what are we going to do? How are we going to heat it? How's, where's the water going? Blah, blah, blah. There's a lot to think about. You're trying to design your house. How high is the trailer? I know there's a lot going on, but if you just sort of work your way through it one step at a time, um, it's not as, you know, it's not as bad as you think. It's all relatively straightforward. So if you guys have got any questions or I've been blatantly lying about some of these things I'm saying or it doesn't make any sense um, please comment below and we'll try to, we'll try our best to answer all of those questions and so if you're into these videos at all just please subscribe because yeah it does help us out and hit that like button we'll see you next time